Magnify the Lord wherever you are. Let's give him our greatest praise tonight. I'm going to ask you just to begin by praying a warfare prayer. Amen. I rebuke the devourer. I rebuke the devil. I rebuke every demonic force that has been sent by Satan to attack you, your family, your legacy, this church, this city. And by the blood of Jesus, we command the forces of darkness to leave and be pushed back in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Give God a victory shout. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Good to have so many friends and family members here. I'm Pastor Ronnie. I'm the lead pastor. And welcome to the 2023 Prophetic Summit brought to you by Fresh Oil Ministries. So glad to have everyone here tonight. I don't know what you came to do. But I came to receive something from the Lord. I don't know what you came to do, but I came to praise the Lord. Amen. I don't know what you came expecting, but I came expecting a miracle and a fresh filling of the Holy Ghost. That's what I came expecting tonight. And when you expect it, you'll receive it. Amen. You'll have what you believe you can have. And I'm believing for miracles for this entire conference. And I believe we're on miracle ground tonight. I want to make you aware of a few things. We have tables in the lobby. My product is out there. A number of books. My newest book, The Hero Within, on the anointing of the Holy Spirit is out there. Also, The Power of Agreement, written by my father, Dr. Ron Phillips, and myself. We tag team wrote that book. We wrote it too early. The world needs it now. We need unity and agreement now. Can I get an amen? It's out there, sermons. We have a number of things out there. Two things I want to make you aware of. One, I'm leading a group to Israel May 1st through the 10th. There are brochures out there. We have a very cost-effective trip available, but you only have about four weeks to register and or the price goes up. So if God has called you to go to the Holy Land with me and my father, we want you to sign up, register. You need to do that quickly. There are brochures on the table. Also, if you've been to Israel but you've never been on a mission trip or been a part of a crusade in July, we're going to go to the Dominican Republic where we have a children's center that feeds and educates over 100 children. And we're going to preach to thousands of people in a baseball stadium for three nights. We're going to do pastor's conference, women's conference, student conference. We're going to touch one of the poorest regions of that country, and I want you to go with me. And when you take a mission trip with me, it's not the come and watch Pastor Ronnie preach trip. The, we'll land on Saturday. We'll be in 16 to 18 churches on Sunday, and everybody that goes with me will be singing, sharing, or preaching. And so I will put you to work, and you'll feel the power of God in that great country that stood for the nation of Israel. They have an open Bible in the middle of their flag, and you'll feel the power of God there. And I invite you to go with me. There are brochures out there. Our missions pastor, Josh Steinman, will be there. And uh, we would love for you to go with us. Time is of the essence. Let me quickly give you a rundown of the schedule. I will be back to formally introduce one of my mentors and dearest friends, Brother Perry Stone, is tonight. And we're so honored to have him and his beautiful wife, Mama Pam, here tonight. Let's honor Pam. Pam, stand up and let everybody honor you. I know you hate it. <laughs> Pam's a godly woman, and she's been awfully good to Kelly and I. We went to D.C. together. We have great memories together. She's an Alabama fan, but, you know, God gives grace for people like that, okay? And uh, we're so glad to have her. I got to meet Tua Taglavolia because of Pam and Perry and have his autograph and my picture with him because of their ministry and just love them so much. But I'll be back to introduce Perry. But Perry's tonight. Our own Pastor Ron Jones is in the morning. Pastor Ron, stand up and let everybody see you. He'll be bringing the word, one of the greatest preachers in this city. He's preached around the world, and we love Ron. Uh, we can't afford him, so he works for us for free. But uh, he's a fabulous preacher. He'll be preaching uh, tomorrow morning. And our own Pastor Emeritus, my father, and hero, Dr. Ron Phillips, will be tomorrow night. I hope you'll come support my 76-year-old papa tomorrow night, all right? He'll be here. He has a fresh word for us. 
And Saturday morning and evening, the wild man, Randy Caldwell, will be back teaching us about the days of Noah and the prophetic implications that have to do with the days of Noah. It's what I've asked him to teach because four months ago, I was up, couldn't sleep, and Randy was at a, a really small church in Oklahoma, and they were streaming this teaching. And I was glued to the live stream. I even sowed a seed. And it's one of the greatest revelations I've heard. And I've asked Randy to take not only the morning session on Saturday, but the evening, because it's going to take Randy a while to release it to us. But it's powerful. You'll realize what state we're in and what God is trying to to say to his church in this season. It's going to be powerful. And I'll be closing everything out on Sunday morning with a fresh word, amen, that God has given me. I was going to begin a series on the Antichrist, but because of all the attacks we've received, I've changed my message. And I'm going to be preaching a message titled Something Out of Nothing. And so I hope you'll be with us Sunday. And then Monday, I would ask for your prayers. I fly out to Texas to preach live around the world on Daystar Network with our friend Joni Lamb and her family. I'm honored for the opportunity, and I believe God's going to bring the kingdom to some hurting people. I need you to come into agreement with me that many would be saved and touched by the Holy Spirit. Would you do that for me? Thank you so much. And we are just expecting great things this entire week. I just want you to stand up. I've asked my friend, Pastor Stacy Cope. He's a leader in the IPHC denomination. He's one of my dearest friends, a great author. Him and his wife, Sunshine, drove, I think, 19 hours to be with us. I've asked Brother Stacy, pray down the Holy Ghost, would you, Brother Stacy? Welcome, Pastor Stacy Cope. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you now. And we give thanks for this evening. That God, even before any of us was born, you knew this moment would take place. And so, God, there's some people here today that needs a moment. They need a touch. They need a healing. God, they need salvation. So, God, I just cry out for salvation to pour down in this place tonight. And not just tonight, but it will continue to flow day in and day out, week to week, month to month, year to year. God, I pray not only for salvation in the spirit, but God, I pray for salvation in the flesh, just in case if there's someone here tonight. Maybe they decided to come and they said, Lord, if you don't speak to me personally, I'm going to take my life. God, I come against that spirit in the name of Jesus right now. I pray for salvation in this place tonight, God. God, for the soul and for the flesh in the name of Jesus Christ, I cry. God, I pray for revival to take place tonight. We pray for the power of the Holy Ghost to come down in here like we've never seen before. God, I've seen things of yesterday, but God, yesterday's done gone. I pray for the now, the second that we're in, a refreshing and renewing. Let your oil flow that, God, that every single person that's in this place will know that you have touched them. Let them know that they're loved. Let them know that they're cared for. And God, let us grow as disciples in these last days that we will do your will. In your heavenly name we pray. And everyone said, amen. There's honey in the rock, water in the stone, man on the ground, no matter where I go. I don't need to worry now that I know. Everything I need, you've got. There's honey in the rock. Praying for a miracle, thirsty for the living well. Only you can satisfy. to see only you can satisfy this honey in the rock this honey in the rock this honey in the
testify tonight. And I keep praying. You keep moving. I keep praising. You keep proving. I have all that I need. Oh, yeah. You have all that I need. Oh, yeah. Come on, house. And I keep looking. I keep finding. You keep giving. You provide. I have all that I need. You have all that I need. I keep praying.
don't you trust you?
eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard what God has in store for those he loves. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, we have something we like to do here at Abbas House. It's time to give. Hallelujah. We believe giving is an act of worship. It's not an escape from worship. It's not a break from worship. It's a part of worship. So we want to give you an opportunity to give tonight. You can do it by way of text. We have kiosk at our exits if you want to go there and sow a seed that way. Many of our people like to bring their offerings down as an act of worship. It's been a tough week for me. Our church has been under attack from demonic people. And I've been in prayer and I've been in a season of reflection. And as I was praying today, the Lord said, Ronnie, I want you to sow a seed of defense tonight. And I've had so much going on, my phone's not stopped with texts and calls and mostly from people who love this ministry and love me, praying for me. I appreciate all of that. Thank you. Keep it up. But I said, Lord, what is a seed of defense? And through a trusted vessel, the Lord took me to Ecclesiastes chapter 11, where it says, Cast your bread, your seed, upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. You see, their homes were built right by the shoreline. And when storms would come, the waters would flood up to their homes. And in order to preserve their materials, their food, their crop, they would cast their bread, their seed, on the waters. That's where we get our word recede from, when waters recede. And by doing that, they were sowing a seed of defense against the storm so that when the storm passed, they would have more than enough to do what God had called them to do. And then I thought of Jacob and Esau. Jacob, Israel, started off as a liar and a cheater and a deceitful person. He swindled his own brother out of his birthright, stole the blessing, but years later, there would be reconciliation between the two of them. But before there could be reconciliation, Jacob had to sow a seed of defense. He had to send livestock, and there were certain levels and a timeline so that when he was face to face with his brother, he wouldn't have to worry about being killed by his brother. Can I get an amen? So I believe God wants us to sow a seed of defense tonight so that when the storm passes by, there'll be more than enough. So I'm going to have you stand up with your seed or your phone. You can text your gift. I believe we have the ways you can give. We'll put on the screen. If you're watching online with our online campus, they will tell you how to give online. We have kiosks at that exit and at that exit. Text to give, 423-781-0248. Hold your phone up or your seat up tonight, your seat of defense. Heavenly Father, I bless the sower tonight. I bless the people of Abba's house, the partners of Voice of Evangelism and Fresh Oil Ministries. I bless the pastors here tonight from other cities and states. Lord, we are tired of God's people being attacked and accused. And tonight, we sow a seed of defense, a seed for truth and justice and righteousness. And Lord, as we sow this seed tonight, we are declaring a harvest, a harvest of grace, a harvest of truth, and a harvest of abundance so that the true kingdom church will be here when you return and call us home. So, Lord, bless the sower tonight. We believe by faith that every need will be met, that all bills will be paid tonight. In Jesus' name we sow. Amen. You may bring your offering. 
There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. first lessons I learned 20 years ago was when the man of God has a word and he's ready to preach, let him preach. The man of God has a word and he's ready to preach. 
but I believe in giving honor where honor is due. Perry Stone's written over 100 books. He's published Christian music, started Voice of Evangelism many moons ago. He's been on Manifest for a number of years, traveled the world over thousands of times, thousands of people saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, healed. As a young man, he preached where I went to high school in Saudi Daisy, Tennessee, and led a two-week revival that they still talk about to this day that many of my friends, grandparents, and great-grandparents were saved at. He's a hero of mine because even though the devil's tried to kill him, he's still standing. And I love him. I believe he's one of the greatest minds in our generation in Hebrew roots. Please honor my friend, one of my father's best friends, a hero of this house, Brother Perry Stone. I want you to give, I really want you to give the Lord a shout with your mouth, a clap with your hands, a stomp with your feet. Praise God. Oh, hallelujah. Wow. I cannot tell you how happy I am to be able to uh, minister. Anytime I can minister, uh, I'm 63. Can y'all believe that? I started coming here when I was a baby. Uh, going on 64, and the more you, the longer you go, most of you know this, the more you appreciate little things, right? <laughs> yes. I need somebody to bring me a little bit of water. I'm going to try to keep it here without spilling it because I'm I'm known for slapping people in pulpits. So, <laughs> not really people. I'm just saying that. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much. I love this brother right here. We're doing a fantastic job. Where's the home folks tonight? And Pastor Ron uh, is part of my accountability team, and I love this man so much. His wisdom um, and you know, when I preached that, it was an eight-week revival in Daisy. Uh, Pastor Phillips had members from the church. It, was, it had been the old building, though. It wasn't this building. They were coming to that revival, getting filled with the Spirit, and he was too afraid to come. And he told me that himself. And one night, now this is old school. I, I couldn't do this today. Now, this is old Pentecostal stuff, and some of you have never seen this, and you're going to think I've lost my mind saying this, but those were benches, not seats. And I was a kid. I weighed, <laughs> I ain't going to tell you what I weighed. <laughs> it's a lot less than now. But uh, the power of God hit me, and I jumped off the platform, and I didn't even know what I was doing, and ran the backs of the benches, and everybody I laid hands on got filled with the Holy Ghost. And a bunch of those were Abba's house kids. I guess it wasn't Abba. Was it Abba's house back then? It was uh, Central Baptist, wasn't it? In the old building, is that right? Yeah. So uh, aren't you glad that uh, me and Brother Ron became friends? And we used to have our conference here, and we're so happy. All right, where is uh, the Charlie? I'm going to take one minute because you, you all don't understand. I'm really ready to preach. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to warn you in advance, it's going to be Perry Stone Unleashed tonight. I've had it with the devil, and I'm about to go there. And I'm going to show you a word God gave me, and we're just going to open it up. you probably hear some things I've never shared before. The soon coming, coming out, sorry, the soon closing out of the church age, this is on the manifest telecast, that's one of the keys to the timing of the rapture. You, and I hope you hear, get this and listen to all two hours. Let me make this clear. When I, when I did this, I said, I've got to preface it before I talk about it. I am not saying Jesus will not come until 2033. I am telling you, Willie George and I, as, as, an, as an illustration, many years ago, sat up till 3.30 in the morning talking about that date right there. And I finally decided to explain why that is a very, very significant time frame. It's 2033, not 2023, 2033. Please get these, and we have some books out there if you watch. Uh, oh, there's the book, The Visions, which I found the original papers, by the way. I, went, I meant to take them today, start, but Dad wrote this on with the blue ink. I found them today in a file. But my dad had a man walk in and talk about a Russian nuclear attack on the United States, and for the first time in my lifetime, they're saying, we lose the war, we're going to use nukes, and we're going to use them against the West. I want you to read what the man, it was an angel of God, it was a man that disappeared out of the house 
after he told my dad the stories. A lot. It's not just that. There's a lot in there. So anyway, are you still here? Shout yes. It's good to have my wife here. Pam, raise your hand. I know you won't want to stand up because you just enjoy sitting there beside the three sisters there that, that you've come to know over the years, or two sisters you've come to know over the years. I want you to open your Bible to 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. And we're so excited. Our, our Thursday night is our normal prayer night, and it's good to see a couple of our folks here. Thank you for being here. <clears throat> the other day, I was at my office, and I love it when the Spirit of God will just suddenly, out of the clear, put a scripture in your, in your spirit, and then he will tell you to notice a certain phrase. And he told me specifically by his Spirit to preach this tonight and I do know that there's tens of thousands probably online. And this will be one of the most significant words that the Lord has given me in quite some time. Today, I didn't go to work much. I stayed at home and I asked the Lord to give me wisdom of what to say because I could go off and share some personal things that might not be preferable at this season to share. But I will tell you some things that I think need to be said. In 1 John 2, 28, listen to this very carefully. And now, little children, these were John's converts and people in the church that he loved, abide in him that when he shall appear, we may have confidence. This is very strange, that when he appears, we have confidence. Confidence in what is the question I ask, and not be ashamed before him at his coming. And I notice it did not say and not be ashamed at him or for him, but before him at his coming. You will not be ashamed because he has returned because the Bible tells us in John 14, 1 through 2, he would come again and receive his children unto himself that where he is we would be. You would not be ashamed of him because you see him. Because we know 1 John 3 and 2 says, the Below were the sons of God, but when we shall see him, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. You're not ashamed because you've seen him. You are expecting at some point to visibly see the Lord. You will, you're not ashamed because the rapture has happened. Because I do believe if you've heard these two men on the platform preach there's not many of us left that believe there's going to be a rapture but I'm willing to wave the rest of them goodbye when me and you are going up if you don't mind you're not going to be ashamed of the rapture because most of you believe it so I'm puzzled by reading the text just as a surface reading without asking myself numerous questions as to what would cause us to be ashamed. And then I recall parables because there are several parables that Jesus gave in the four Gospels that are kingdom parables that literally allude to events either at the moment of or just after his coming and at the judgment. And one of those very famous is the ten virgins. All of them are virgins. All of them are told that the bridegroom is coming. All of them are asleep. Suddenly the call comes and they all wake up. The problem was, or is, that five of them have fully prepared for the return. Five of them are missing something. The Bible calls it oil, extra oil. They did not have what it took to be prepared the moment the event happened. They talked about the moment. They revelated about the moment. They kept each other excited about the moment, but something happened near midnight that caused everybody to get lazy, and five woke up, and five were not prepared. I'm going to preach a message one of these days based on that parable and some other references in the Bible and show you half of the church is not ready for the rapture. 
And if you don't believe it, look at all the statistics that Abarna and everybody else is giving us after COVID. Half the church people have not returned back to a local assembly since COVID because they've gotten used to keeping their pajamas on and drinking their hot chocolate and eating their breakfast while they watch their favorite preacher. I've got news for you. The Bible says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some. Watch this and so much more as you see the day of the Lord approaching. So we, we see this and we understand that not everybody will be ready, but that does not answer the question. He's talking to people who are ready. He's talking to people who are prepared, but he said, if you're not careful, your confidence is going to be shattered and you're going to be ashamed when he comes. Is, does he, is, is he alluding to the five foolish virgins, perhaps? Is he alluding to that there are people who aren't going to make it and they're going to say, oh my, I fell short. No, 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 no. Because if you continue to read, he's not just talking about the return. He says that you will not be ashamed before him. At his coming. It is the phrase that before him, the phrase before him that becomes the significant phrase that ties in where the being ashamed comes from. First of all, let me just say something to you that being ashamed, if we read, it has to do with standing before the Lord when. He comes. If you read the book of Revelation in chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, John hears a voice. The voice says, come up here. Immediately he is in the spirit and the voice is like a trumpet. That is a imagery of the rapture in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18. And then he sees a multitude not sitting in chairs, standing before the throne of God. He sees another group in chapter 7 and they're waving palm branches standing before the throne of God. And then in chapter 14, he sees 144,000 Jews standing before the throne of God. Listen to me carefully. There is no sitting down when you get to heaven. Not at least at the temple. Not at least in the throne room. There are no seats. The only seat at the throne room is the throne of God where he is high and lifted up and sitting on his eternal throne. And Jesus, who is at his right hand, and 24 smaller thrones that are elders. But outside of that, outside of the judges who are sitting according to Daniel, outside of God who is the judge, and Christ who is the judge at the judgment seat, outside of them, being seated to perform the acts of tribulation judgment and personal judgments. Everybody else is standing on their feet, standing and viewing him. So we are, this is what the Bible says, Luke 21, 36. Pray that you be able to escape these things and to stand before the Son of Man. Romans 14 and 10. We must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Revelation 20 and 12. I saw the small and great the rich and the poor, all stand before the throne of God. Hebrews 9, 27. It is appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. So the question becomes, what does it mean to be ashamed? To be ashamed as you are standing before him. First of all, I'm a word study nut, and I like to make sure the word means what it says. And many times I find out that in the Greek or Hebrew, the word that is translated into the English language has a different nuance to it, or different tense, or sometimes an actual different meaning. There are, there are, the word ashamed is used 26 times in Scripture, and it's four different words, especially when you come to the Greek New Testament. Four different words. And here in this Greek word ashamed, it is found, this Greek word for ashamed, ashamed that is coming, ashamed, is found five times out of the 26 places where the word ashamed is used. This particular word. It means 
to be disfigured, to be disgraced, and to feel shame for yourself. Let me, read, let me say it again. This Greek word, ashamed of his coming, means to be disfigured, disgraced, or to feel shame for yourself. Now, let me stop. Because in the judgments, there are two. And I'm not going to delve into this deep. You've heard this taught on, I'm sure, by Dr. Phillips. There's the bema. That's the Greek word found for the English word judgment seat. A synagogue had a bema. This would be considered a bema in a synagogue. It's a race platform. The races, the Olympic races, had in the middle a platform where the judges sat with their rewards. There's different types of bemas. There's outdoor bemas. There's indoor bemas. So there is a judgment seat. Now, I'm not going to preach on this. I just did a two-hour teaching that's going to be released in the month of April. There's a, there's, a, there's a building in heaven called the temple, of the, tes, the temple of the Tabernacle of the Testimony. It's not only where every record about you is stored, but it is also where Christ's throne is. I can prove it from the Bible. God's throne is on the outside where there's 24 thrones. That's the temple of heaven. But the temple of the witness of your testimony is a building directly behind the throne of God that has doors that are entered where the ark is and it is where Christ's throne and Christ's bema and the judgment seat takes place. Now let me make this very clear. That the great white throne judgment in Revelation 20 is about the works of men it's about people that are judged that have been in hell. It's about judging fallen angels. It's about judging people that lived during the tribulation and died. They all have to be judged, but that's in Revelation 20. The Bema is not necessarily a judgment for sin because if you had lived in unconfessed sin and you had died in un unrepentant and unconfessed sin, then you can forfeit that judgment and go through the tribulation. I wish somebody would help me preach here. I can prove that from the Bible talking about your name being erased from the book of life. And we won't get into that because that's a whole theological teaching. But the Bema, <laughs> get ready. The Bema is about how I lived while I served the Lord. Talk to me some. Help me, Brother, brother, uh, uh, brother Ron, help me. It's about how you served the Lord. It's about what you did with what God gave you. It's about using your talents. It's about five crowns, some say even possibly six, that you could receive if you were in a certain position, a certain fivefold ministry, if you did certain things, if you died a martyr, there's a martyr's crown. But it goes deeper than that because it also deals with how I treated other people while I lived in my body. It is also about idle words that you spoke. I'm about to go there. While you lived in the so-called Christian body, attending a Christian church and dressing like a saint but having a tongue so long you could wrap it around a telephone pole five times. <laughs> I'd like to prove this to you. This judgment is not about did you sin or not sin with the sins that are listed in the Bible if those sins are under the blood. I'm going to talk about the blood for just a minute. I get a little bit perturbed at church members who went to an altar and repented of their sins, got up hooping and hollering, talking about how they've been forgiven and how their name is in heaven. But when a brother sins, they want to keep reminding him of what he did. I'd like to ask you a theological question. How long does it take you to get forgiven? Number two, how long does it take the blood to work? 
So in case you don't understand how fast the blood works, let me interview a man that was hanging on a cross beside Jesus. You don't know his name, but all you know is they call him a thief. Let me talk about a man on the left, and let me talk about a man on the right, and let me talk about some red blood that was pouring out feet, some red blood that was coming from his hands, some red blood that was dripping on his back that was moistening the backside of the cross. Let me talk about a crown of thorns that was on his head and let me tell you a conversation where one man said if you're the son of God why don't you come off this cross and save us but let me tell you about another man that said what are you talking about we deserve to be on this thing and he says these words Lord will you remember me when you come into the kingdom now ain't that weird I don't read where he got an altar call I didn't read where Jesus said now if you want to be saved I'm about to die but I want you to pray a 23-word sinner's prayer with me. And I want somebody to get the church books out to make sure that we write their name in the church books. Jesus didn't say to him, you need to repent. Jesus didn't say to him, confess your sins. You know why? Because he already knew what he was. You don't have to repent when you already know what you are. He already knew he was a thief. He already knew that he did wrong. He knew that if that's the son of God, he already knew who he was and what he did but he said remember me now in case you don't know Jesus said today you shall be with me in paradise how long did it take him to get forgiven how many prayers did he have to pray can I'm telling you what remember means remember means recall <laughs> but let me do a little bit of word study for you remember is the opposite of dismember dismember means to pull apart the world had pulled him apart being a thief had messed him up and broken him. Being a sinner had messed him up and just tore up his life. But he didn't say, I want you to, to dismember me. He was already dismembered. But he said, I want you to remember. Remember in its common sense means put me back together again. So he was saying, I have been dismembered. I have been in a bad way. I have been a bad man. But if you can put me back together again, when you get into your kingdom, I'd appreciate you doing it. Can I tell you that Jesus already knows what you've done? You don't have to pray a long prayer to remind him, oh, God, you know that a long time ago, way back in the day, God already has a record of it. What God's wanting you to do is hurt hurry up and get covered by the blood so he can blot it out so the devil can't accuse you of it. But there are people. <laughs> Let me preach here. Without naming names of which I do not do in the pulpit, I have known of people in my lifetime that if their records were read, <laughs> if the bodies could be found, God, did I say that? They'd go to prison the rest of their life if the bodies could be found. No, I'm, I'm not playing with you. If, uh, if certain investigators would look into things that I know about people, they go to federal prison. All they gotta do is find the stuff. Well, I'm telling too much. But see, I'm not interested. I am not interested in bringing up somebody else's stuff. Because in the Old Testament, I read where God said to Israel, keep yourself. My wife says it best. I'm not going to answer for Tom, Dick, and Harry. I'm not going to answer for everybody who's lied on me and offended me. I'm going to answer for me. So I've got to keep myself right with God. When is the church going to realize that God didn't call you to be the judge and the jury and the hangman? All God wants you to do is follow him and serve him and keep yourself in right standing with God because may I remind you, you will answer for you. I'm going to say it this way. You will answer for you, but they will answer for what they did to you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
very simple. Now, if you want the verse, I want you to listen. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Romans 14, 10 through 13. We're going, to, we're going to plow in a minute. I'm just getting started. I have a word for you. I don't want you ashamed at the coming of the Lord. But here's how you'll be ashamed. Why do you judge your brother? Why do you show contempt toward your brother? This is your brother in the Lord or sister in the Lord. We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it's written as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. Now let me stop. Every knee shall bow to me. Every tongue shall confess to God. Now we think that means every tongue shall confess that I am Lord. And he says that. But that's confessing to him. Deny me before men, I deny you before my father. So why does he say here? Now, now look at the text. Why does he say here that every tongue, every knee will bow to me, but every tongue will confess to God? What are you confessing? You're confessing how you judged your brother. Read it. This is what terrified Paul. When Paul said it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of an angry God, he's a believer. What does he have to fear? He's not going to hell, but he knew he had murdered a boy named Stephen one time, and he was the first Christian murderer, and he'd have to see Stephen one day. Was he forgiven? Absolutely. But he still knew, I have to account for what I did to other people. Oh, preach, Perry, I'm going to. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this. In other words, whatever your issue is, resolve it. Resolve it and shut up about it and move on. Here's why. Let us not put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in a brother's way. Now, wait a minute. What does that mean? I'm going to explain it to you this way. I'm going to take a local church for an example. You attend a local church. You have family that goes to a local church. You have children in that local church. Something happens in that church you do not like. So instead of you saying, you know what, we need to pray. What we need is a prayer meeting. What we need is to fast and pray and get the mind of God. And what we need to understand is this ain't nothing but the devil. Let's call it what it is. And instead of people being spiritual, what they will do, oh, Jesus, help me get this across. What they will do is they will go home after a service or after hearing something or reading something and sit in their front of their grandkids and in front of their children who have a tender heart, who are not hardened yet to, go, to anything, who are simple-minded, and they will eat the preacher and give their opinion and just say, I'll give them a piece of their mind and what you don't know. What the enemy is doing, he's setting you up for a few years from now because what you don't know is when later, when later you get your heart right and you repent, then you're going to try to get those kids in church and you can't get them in church. Do you know why? You turned them away from the very preacher in church that would have won them. God assigned you in that place. I, I, even if it's Abba's house, he assigns you here to bring your family to be a part. And so the reaction of what you do or say is not just about you. Why do we make it about us? I give him a piece of my mind. Here's what my opinion is. Here's what I think. You ain't going to be judged by your opinion. You're going to be judged by your treatment of how you use that opinion and so now your kids won't go to church your grandbabies won't go to church you know why they don't trust nobody they don't have confidence in nobody you know why because you ran the confidence down in the church and the ministries a long time ago everybody's a hypocrite and no, no preacher serving God they're, they're, they're all a bunch of crazies and one day you get right and you repent six years later and you got kids now you can't beg them you can't prod them you can't pay them and they're going to go to hell because of you I'm going to be blunt 
they are going to burn in hell because you were belligerent to the things of God and instead of allowing the Holy Spirit to direct you, you became carnal. And you can repent. Oh yeah, I can, you can repent down the road. You can go to the person and make it right. But after you've wrecked them and destroyed them and now they won't even sit under a ministry that could have won them to God and seen them baptized in the Holy Ghost. This is what Paul is so concerned about. What are we judging people? Listen, listen, listen. What are we judging people anyway? Now stop and think. Do we judge their hairdo? I don't like that hairdo. I understand what if that was mine. No, we care about people's hair. Do we judge the clothes they wear? Maybe in the old days, they judged how you looked. People don't do that anymore. We judge one thing in everybody, their failure. Because if there's not a failure in their life that we can judge, there's nothing to judge. We may prefer the lights up instead of the lights out. We may prefer a smoke machine versus not a smoke machine. We may prefer the red back hymnal, but that's preference. Everybody's got preferences. Old timers over 60, we like a certain kind of music. Don't look at me. I wish somebody would help me preach in this house. I don't know who I'm preaching to tonight. We like a certain kind of music, the younger generation, but that is not about sin. That's about preference. And you can have 10 different, pre the type of seat you like. Well, I like the flat chair. I like it because it's slanted. I can see. I like to sit in the front. I like to sit in the back. The PA system is good here. It's too loud there. That's preference. We all are eat up with our preferences of what we like or don't like. I like to wear a tie. I don't like to wear a tie. I like to wear jeans. I don't like to wear jeans. Blah, 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 blah. Preference, preference, preference. But preference is opinion. But let's take it deeper. <laughs> Why do we spend so much time in other people's business? I know some people in Cleveland who to my knowledge, have not worked a steady job or either worked a job in years. And God knows they need a job because all they do is get on the internet and blog their opinions. But what, why do we judge other people? Can I tell you why other people get judged? It makes you feel better when you judge somebody else's failure because if you didn't fall in that area, it makes you feel more holy. I've never had that problem, bless his holy name. I cannot. I'm going to tell you the truth. I, I have never smoked cigarettes, so it's hard for me to understand when someone says, man, I'm having a hard time. My deal is like, dude, come on. You can lay them down. Just don't go buy a pack. You ever smoke? How many used to smoke? Or some of you still smoke. You're smoking Baptist. I know you are. But how many of you ever had a smoking habit? Raise your hand. Be honest with me. Was it hard to quit? Come on, tell the truth. Was it hard? To quit? <laughs> I think Pastor Half of them still have it because of the way they're looking at me right here, okay? No, but, but can I say something? It, but I'm allergic to it, so I don't think I'd ever have the habit because I'm allergic to it. So if I get around it, my eyes water, uh, can't breathe, so I'm okay there. But I want to have compassion for you. I want to be able to look at you and say, man, your lungs are going to get bad, you know? Your heart's going to get bad. You don't want to do that. I don't want to beat you over the head. I mean, the old-time Pentecostal were like, I tell you what, if God wanted you to smoke, he'd have made your nose upside down like a smokestack. Oh. Really? So all the smokers would have an upside-down nose. Is that how we know you smoked? But I can remember they put people in hell for smoking. No, that's a habit. It's a habit. That All it is is a habit. Is it unclean? Sure. But I don't want to beat you up just because I don't do it. Amen. Alcohol's another area. I would, I'm never tempted. I was ne hey, Ronnie Jr., I was never tempted to drink beer because it reminded me of something I saw when I went to the men's room. I'm not going to go further than that. So I was never, no, I never had a, and then and one time I just, I just, now, don't, don't send me to hell. But one time I took a sip just to see what it tasted like, and I said, dear God, how can anybody drink this? I was spitting and hawking, and I said, Lord, thank you that, thank you that I am not one of these. Thank you. 
But if people have a taste for it and have acquired taste and they get into bondage and they get into being an alcoholic, I am not. You, can I tell you why I don't want to beat them up? I want to help them. I want to see if I can help them get free. Let me get, let me get you in a rehab. Can I tell you why? Because the Bible said you must consider your brother lest you fall into the same thing. So what do we, so what, so we'll judge the guy that smokes because we've never smoked. Praise God. We'll judge the guy that drinks heavy because we've never had that problem. Uh, you don't want me to go there now. I'm about to go somewhere. Well, I tell you what, all these preachers having these women trouble. What about the women? How come the preachers get fussed at and nobody ever talks about the women? Every man who's normal is going to be attracted to a female. That's why you got married. Preach. And every female eventually will get attracted to a guy, and that's why you're married. How many are married? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Come on. Come on. Don't be a, This is not a loaded question. How many of you married somebody that was pretty or still is pretty in your eyes? Raise your hand. I'll raise my hand. It's true. Praise God. So attraction is normal. boy come up to me one time he said oh god brother pray, pray for me what's wrong son he said i'm just lusting like crazy i'm lusting like. i said you're single son he said I'm, I'm single and i said okay but what tell me the way he said there's these girls that wear short dresses and my mind's going all over the place and he was so sincere and i just laid hands on him and in the name of jesus i rebuked this and i was praying i was sincere i wanted him to be him and he come back the next day thank you brother perry thank you for praying my god i'm free i looked at girls today and didn't think nothing bad i said well that's great a week went by how you doing son doing pretty good and then we the revival went on remember up in Maryland and he come a couple days later and he said oh pray, pray for me he said that devil's back <laughs> I said what devil son he said that devil look at the girls he said I'm looking at him again I said son put your hands up with me and say thank God I'm not gay come on say it with me right now say thank God I'm not gay I said, you do understand you're a single boy. You do understand it's okay to look, not lust, but it's okay to look. You're going to find a wife to marry. But I said, and the Lord, listen to me now. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, tell him he don't need deliverance. He just needs some discipline. When, you're, when pornography is a problem, you don't need a pornography devil necessarily knock, knocked out of you. What do you need? Filters on your systems. Some of it's practical. Some of it's just really practical stuff. But listen to me. Don't ever, and I, there, there's a group of ministers that, 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 I, that I know that one of them got on TV and called a guy cancer in the body of Christ and two years later did the very thing he's accused the other preacher of. Listen, you will be judged by the same thing you're judging others in. That's why I don't say nothing. I say, ain't my business. I pray for them. I'm not going to fuss at you if you got a habit. I'm not going to fuss at you if you've got under bondage. I want to preach for you and to you that the power of Almighty God can come on you and set you free from anything you need to be set free from. And that's a good place for somebody to give the Lord a praise because that's the word of God. Mm. Mm. So what do we do? So we hear something. I'm going to preach this here. We hear something and we just immediately repeat it because we assume it's fact or it's from a good source. Or a, a, I found out that in my case, a reliable source is a real liable. <laughs> All right, there's my wife can verify everything I'm saying. Not reliable. So we, so we repeat it. Now I'm going to give you what God told me. I wrote a book called Fishing in the Sea of Forgetfulness. And the Holy Spirit showed me this by revelation. I want everybody to hear it. I'm going to help you to, I'm going to help some of you tonight if you will listen to this entire message because we're going somewhere in just a minute. Y'all still here? Amen. I'm here one night. Don't press me down and act like you're in a hurry. How many of you know what the Ten Commandments are? Raise your hand. How many of you know that one of them says you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor? Raise your hand if you understand that commandment. You've heard it. Okay, what does it mean? 
I always thought it meant you won't tell a lie on your neighbor. Bear false witnesses to tell a lie. So don't ever tell a lie on your neighbor. And I assume that was the simple explanation of it. However, when you start looking what the Bible says in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word is established. It is established so you would not say, he killed my calf. And you got a dead calf over there and you're accusing him of doing it because God says, okay, to prove he killed your calf, bring another person who saw it with their eyes. If you can't bring a person who saw it with their eyes, then it doesn't stand in court. You cannot go to court and say, uh, well, you know, uh, Bill, Bill told Ruth and Ruth told Sam and I have a third cousin named Billy Bob down there in uh, uh, Hickson and, uh, you know, we, that's, that's how it got around. They'll throw it out of court because it's a second and third party. A court needs something called intent and evidence. If you don't find the gun, you're going to have a hard time convicting. If you don't find the fingerprints on the gun, you got another problem. If you don't find somebody who saw him shoot the gun, you got another problem. Now, I know for a fact with investigations that there are people who heard that they heard that they heard and nobody said, you, sorry, that don't count. Am I telling the truth now? Doesn't count because anybody could say anything and lie. Therefore, that's why it doesn't count. God spoke to me and he said, you need to teach my people this. Someone comes to them with gossip. Someone comes with them with something they've heard, okay? They do not know they were not there and they repeat it. What if that person is told an outright complete lie? You've just repeated an outright complete lie that makes you as guilty as the person who told it to you. Can I tell you something? If you didn't see it and you weren't there and you repeat it, you were a false witness and you've just broken the commandment. People come to me and they say, like this happened a while back. They say, hey, that brother so-and-so down in Atlanta, he's wanting everybody to buy him a plane. Cost all this money. What do you think, Perry? I said, not my business. Ask anybody that asked me. Not my business. Well, but you're a preacher. You should have an opinion. I don't have an opinion. You know why I don't have an opinion? I don't know him. I've never given him a dime of support. That's between his partners and him, and it ain't between me or you, so shut up. That's his business. A friend of mine fell into a trap many years ago was a fee, with, with the situation with the female, stepped down for a while, went through uh, restoration, and I happened to be in Cleveland, Tennessee, the headquarters for the Church of God, the gossip grapevine of America. So I knew. I'm going, to, I'm going to Panera Bread. And they had a church conference and all the preachers were in town. So help me, I know all of them because they're from Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia. I know all of them. And I, God says to me, he says, when you walk, God, I feel the Holy Ghost. He said, when you walk in there, the preachers are talking about your friend and said, you don't open your mouth and you rebuke them if they ask you for anything. Okay? I was real excited to walk in and rebuke some preachers. Walked in. There, hey, guys, how you doing? Hey, have you heard about so? Yeah, and you know what? It ain't my business, and it ain't yours. That's between him and his family and his church. What do you think? I don't think because it's not my business, and it's not yours, so you need to keep your nose out of where it don't belong. We would stop a lot of gossip in the body of Christ if we stand up to people who are false accusers, liars, and slanderers. Now that's a good place to clap your hands and praise the Lord. I'm about to get into something else here. The Lord just spoke to me on the platform. Stay with me now. Okay. There's a verse in the Bible, and I'll be honest with you, this one is very shaking because everybody in this room has said things at times that you wish you could take back unless you just can't talk. Have you ever said something? You said, oh, I really shouldn't have said that. I wish I could take that back. Let me see how many honest people have taken the halos off your head and the wings off your back. To Look at that. Okay, we all have. Would you agree? Now, now, this to me is a verse of Scripture that's frightening for Perry Stone. 
okay? Because what I'm teaching you tonight is what God's had to teach me for the past couple years personally. That's why it's powerful for me to get it to you because this is something I've had to learn. Every idle word shall men give an account of on the day of judgment, Matthew 12, 20, 36. Wait a minute. Every, every idle word that come out of your mouth you will give an account of face-to-face -face at the Bema on the day of judgment when you stand before God. That means every idle word has been recorded. Can I prove it? By your words, you will be justified, or by your words, you shall be condemned. Your own words will condemn you. He don't have to say nothing. He, all he's got to do is play the results. All he's got to do is show the book. Nobody, nothing has to be said. There it is. It's in the record book in that temple I talked about all there idle is worthless it is from the Greek word um, arg argoas and it means unemployed fruitless a word that has absolutely no value connected to it on the day of judgment the word spoken that had no value or that hurt people or slandered people or lies you repeated you will answer directly. Look, I'm, this, you know, can I tell you, you can preach this and people look at you. You know why? Because they ain't got a fear of God in them anymore. You have a fear of God in you, you'll start paying attention to verses like this. Whew. We were having a service. I'm going to publicly tell this. And I got people here that's going to hear this for the first time. Because it fits this. We're having a service. We didn't put it online because we decided uh, that it was going to be for the house So on a Tuesday. I'm getting ready to make a statement, and I hear a female voice from the back that I later find out has a hoodie and a mask on to hide her identity screaming at the top of her lungs. And I'm, I, I don't know. It's like, okay, what's going on here? Well, my wife and I, my attorney has the papers. I'm not making this up. It's now about 20 lies, but we've had 16 to 20 lies told on us, and my attorney has all the papers right now. I've got one of the top attorneys in America. Thank you. You've asked me about that. Yes, I do. Okay, just so you know. I turned all the papers to him. I said, it's yours. We'll see what happens. This girl screamed. Our security took her out, and she was belligerent in the lobby. And I find out later that she is someone visiting from out of state with some former staff members staying in their house. I then find out from a local journalist who's asked not to be identified because he'd lose his job that this family contacted a paper and told a journalist pretty close to here to send somebody into the service and tape it because she was going to disrupt it and yell. It was, all, it was all planned out. Some of you didn't know this, I'm telling you. It's all planned out. We find this out. My daughter is good friends with a close friend of this girl. She doesn't live in the area, lives out of state. So this friend called her and said, what are you doing? Why did you disrupt that service? And she said... That wasn't me. I was in Atlanta that night. That was somebody else and lied through her teeth because my security people knew her. Now, can I ask you this? Am, am, am I confused here or does it make sense that you stand up to rebuke somebody for what you think they are, but you can lie and get by with it? Since when does the lie become okay? Let it, I'm, I'm, I'm going to let it sink in. Sink in, Jesus. Sink in. Because this is what the body of Christ is putting up with. Pam, I'm going to tell it all. One day my wife says, have you seen this on this crazy, we call her the crazy woman, this crazy woman's internet site? I said, what is it? She says, it's a picture of all the stuff you've collected. 
and there's a picture of a gold coin, gold coin, and a ring, and it, it, a lot of it's Pam's, a lot of it's mine. I bought it over the years, collected over the years. It's 60 pieces. I said, huh, I know who take, took those pictures, a former staff member. And by the way, my attorney said, if I can find the paper he signed that he can't release them, he's in trouble. So I'm not trying to look for that. I'm not trying to get anybody in trouble. I'm trying to forgive as I've been forgiven. That's why I, that's why I lay back. That's why I lay back. Could do a lot of things. Could say a lot of things. Lay back. So the crazy woman, as we call her, tells this story. This is offerings that were given to him. This is on the internet by different people and he pays women off with this and he's got them buried in the basement of his church and in the walls of his church. First of all, there's no basement there. Secondly, there's nothing in the walls. Am I a fool? If a fire comes, it burns everything. Hello, dummy. None of it true. The man took them for insurance purposes years ago for me to give to my insurance company in case there was an F5 or a fire and I would show and he kept the pictures secretly and turned them over years later. Oh, that's a real friend, isn't it? Other things have happened that I will not talk about. I think it's wisdom not to. And I say to myself, dude, you're acting that way and yet if the truth be known of your past what would happen to you and you talk about people and you don't even know a former journalist in this area made a statement how do I know because a journalist was in a certain place with him and heard him say, I have come to this area to take down Ron Phillips, Perry Stone, and Kevin Wall. And you've read his articles probably the past couple of years. And that came from a man who said, don't use my name, I'm, I'll be in trouble if you do. And yet, who do we repeat? Who do we quote? I'm going to say it this way. The snake... In the garden. Gave Satan a voice. I'm going to say it again. The serpent in the garden. The snake in the garden gave Satan a voice. Satan did not come as Satan. Because if he came as the devil you'd know who he was. If he'd have walked in there as the fallen angel, he would have said, who are you? There's only two of us in this place. Where did you come from? But the serpent, according to Josephus, was a creature that lived with them, that they were comfortable with, and the animal kingdom could communicate. So where did the snake get the idea, eat from this tree? It gave voice to someone who was a fallen angel called Satan himself. And people, people, well, let me go there. Three times in the New Testament, Satan is alluded to as influencing people connected with the kingdom. Judas, disciple, treasurer. Satan enters his heart. Why does Satan do it? To betray Jesus. Satan entered his heart to make a huge betrayal because for the Pharisees to arrest Jesus, they had nothing to arrest him on but rumors. But if they can get a disciple that is paid to show all the secrets, then they can legally have a trial and arrest him. Are you listening, somebody? Ananias and Sapphira, what happened to them? They lied to the Holy Spirit. They sat in front of an apostle face to face and told a lie about money and they knew they were lying and yet God let both of them drop dead. Judas committed suicide later on. Look, look, look at another example here. The apostle Peter. Peter now, now Peter's the strange one because watch, Judas is sinning by betraying innocent blood. Are you, would you agree? Talk to me somebody. Ananias and Sapphira have sinned and the Bible said they lied to the Holy Spirit. But look at Simon Peter. 
In the example I'm about to give you, Simon has not blasphemed. Simon has not sinned. Simon has not broken Ten Commandments. All Simon does is say to Jesus, you're not going to die. Far be it from you that you would die. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. That, I'm puzzled by that for years. He's a good guy. He's trying to prevent you from dying. He's protect and protective you. And you're saying the Satan's talking to him. And I said, explain this to me. And God said to me, read it. Satan is trying to disrupt the will of God. And I could not allow the will of God for me to die and crucify, to be disrupted by one of my disciples, discouraging me from dying, telling me I could get out of it. Are you listening, somebody? One time Satan is involved with betraying somebody in the ministry. One time Ananias and Sapphira are involved with telling a bald-faced lie that they knew was a lie. And another time Simon Peter is rebuked because he yielded his voice to the voice of Satan. And when Satan spoke through him, it was to stop the will of God. Is it possible that the biggest hindrance in the body of Christ is bitterness, envy, jealousy, and unforgiveness? Is it possible the reason God's not sending a revival yet is we've not got our house in order personally yet? We're, tr we're so busy going on the internet blogs and trying to straighten up everybody else's problem and give our opinions as to why that happened that we don't even have time to have a prayer meeting for ourselves and look, at our, look in the mirror and say, what have you done lately that you need to repent of? Preach somebody, help me preach in this. I'm taking my time. James chapter 5, 12. He talks about the danger of your mouth. And he says this, let your yes be yes and your no be no, lest you enter into condemnation. What does it mean your yes be yes and your no be no? Have you noticed when someone asks you a question, you can never say yes or no. You have to say yeah. But here's what I think. No, no, but I want to tell you what I think about that. I don't think we should be saying no. I think, why do we keep talking when the Bible says yes and no? Do you like it? Yes. Why? No reason. Bye. <laughs> you think we should do that? No, not really. Well, what's your opinion? Don't have one. Bye. And let me tell you why we have to say yes and no and keep the conversation brief because the more we talk, the more trouble we get into. I want somebody in the back to clap. Give me a good clap in the back. I see a bunch of young people back there. Give me a good clap because that's where the, that's a good clap. I've often said you never have to apologize for what you don't say. What you say can and will be used against you at the Bema. Jesus opened not his mouth. They went after him, he opened not his mouth. He's at a trial, he opens not his mouth. You know the hardest thing God will ever tell you to do? God told me years ago, keep your mouth shut. Do you know how hard it is for an Italian that talks with his hands and loves to talk and speak in tongues to keep his mouth shut? I won't say impossible, but it's about like Peter walking on water without Jesus. Watch, watch this. I, I, I want you, I want, I want you, I want, is anybody receiving this tonight? Come on, raise your hand if you're, you're hearing and receiving this. I'm, I'm going to be done here in a moment, but, but i got to get this part to you. Yet you. Let your yes be yes, your no be no, lest you enter into condemnation. And the condemnation is when you begin to add to your stories that you've heard and the things that you've heard you start adding, you don't know if it's fact, but you heard it, you read it, you don't know if it's really true, you, you, you read it, uh, and somebody who's belligerent, who does it like the church, who left mad, is the one telling the story. I'll tell you when this will start, stop. Can I tell you when it'll stop? I hate to say this because I'm like the Bible says you know, try to make peace where you can. When we start taking belligerent lying people to court and having them answer in a court case for their lies and belligerence, that's when some of it might stop. 
well, you're not supposed to sue a brother. I'm not talking about suing a brother. I'm talking about suing a devil. Tell you a true story. I met this man. He said to me, he said, I was at a conference many years ago. And he said, there was a book written. I'm not going to name the book or the author. But this is a very well-known book, million bookseller, a self-help book. And someone said, did you hear that that man that wrote that book and named him committed suicide the other day? Oh, you're kidding me. No, this man got up without researching it, told a whole conference room full of people, so-and-so that wrote the book, so-and-so committed suicide. It was not true. It was a lie, and the man was still living. And this man said, they took me to court for four years and it cost me $4 million. The original amount was $20 million for slander. I said, did you have to pay it? He said, I sure did. And he said, I will never again open my mouth and say nothing about nobody. And he said, here, the whole thing was a lie, but the man walked up to me and I didn't vet it. That's what I'm talking about. Saying things. I read things about myself and I said, who, where in the world did that come from? Who in the world said that? And I found out in my case that I had one person, one, that's pretty much behind every, every attack I've been under, one person, one. Yeah, call this person, talk to this person, let's do this, let's do that. One, what'd you do? Turned him over to God, then turned him over to Satan and then told God to take care of him. That's exactly what I did. But what's God going to do? God's going to do what God's going to do when God's going to do it. And I'm going to keep doing what I do, which is stand up behind the pulpit and preach this gospel that I have been preaching for 45 years and not be distracted by belligerent people who don't agree with what I say, preach, or teach. Preach on. I will. The other day, Charlie, stand up. Where you at, Charlie, in the dark? Charlie, you're in the dark. Can you see Charlie in the dark over here? We got, we got an unusual call. And this is what I'm talking about here, about the significance and the importance of the Spirit of God speaking to you and not allowing yourself to fall into traps, not allowing yourself to just believe everything, not allowing yourself, not allowing yourself to just repeat and repeat, learning to say yay and no and no comment and I have nothing to say and that's not edifying so we're not going to go there. Seriously. Woman calls. She says to, got Charlie in, and she said, I know nothing about your ministry. My sister works at such and such a place, has known Perry's ministry for a while, and she was really bad-mouthing him the other day, just bad-mouthing him off of, off of rumors. And I started agreeing with her. Wow, what about that? Isn't that something? Yeah, yeah, and I heard, and I heard, and I heard. And she said, I listened to it. Now, this woman does not know me. This woman has never met me. This woman is only listening to her sister. The next morning she got up to pray. She called and told us this. And when I said, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, the voice of God from heaven said, Who are you? She said, Excuse me, Lord. You know me. I come here every day. He said, Today I will not hear you. I, have, I hear nothing you've got to say. I have, you have no prayer that you pray while I hear. You have talked about my servant. And you've said things you know nothing about. And until you repent to him, I will not hear your prayer. And this woman, whom we did not know, called us on the phone to apologize, and we didn't even know her, and said, I am, if I have a prayer life, I'm going to have to get this right with the Lord. I don't know about her sister. Don't care about her sister. That's between her and her sister. But I know one thing. If you regard iniquity in your heart, the Lord will not hear you. And iniquity is gossip and backbiting and backstabbing and slander and lies. I, come on. I'm, I wish somebody in this house would grab a hold of this message and understand. You're going to answer to God for every idle word. In regard to these think it not strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation speaking evil of you. They will give an account to God who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Accountants keep record, have records. Heaven will have an audit in which the accounts are brought forth and the records are brought forth. And folks, it is an absolute fact, please hear it again, that every 
everybody in this room and listening to me will answer for the words you said about other people. How do you cancel them? You have to go to the people. You have to stand and look at them and apologize to them. Well, what if they don't receive it? That ain't your problem. That's theirs. I've done it before, and I've had one guy years ago, there were, I was a kid, and I was apologizing to a man, and he didn't receive it. And you know, he dropped dead about a year later. And he was a man that I loved. I loved him as a friend, but he didn't receive it. A woman stood up while my dad was preaching in a neighbor, neighboring state, and my dad was having a business meeting. I said, preaching, having a business meeting. And she said, you're a liar. My dad said, excuse me, where that's coming? And she's standing in the back, you're a liar. He said, ma'am, sister, let me tell you something. 17 years of age in West Virginia in a three and a half year revival, I got saved. And I haven't lied since then. She called him a liar again. My dad was left-handed. You knew him, Brother Phillips. And he shot his left hand out and started speaking in tongues and pointed to that woman. And she walked out the door, and the next day she lost her voice completely. And the next week it was gone. And the next month it was gone. And she could not talk. And she went to specialists that said, there's no reason why you can't talk. We don't understand it. And several, I don't know if it was like two months went by. And my dad, I was in a revival at my dad's church in this particular church. And dad said to me, he said, God told me her kids are crying at night wanting their mama. And if I will forgive her for what she did. You know, the Bible says, whoever sins you remit, they're remitted. And whosoever sins you retain, they're retained. And he said, if I will remit her sins of what she said about me and your mom publicly, God will heal her. He called her out that night and told her, whispered in her ear while the choir was singing. And the next day, her voice came back. But you know what she said to people? She says, I have too much pride to apologize to Brother Stone. I was wrong. I know I was wrong, but I'm never going to apologize because I have too much pride. Her house burnt down once, her house burnt down twice, and she died in a car wreck. You better watch how you treat men and women of God. I could tell you other stories that would blow your mind of people who mistreated dad, board members that mistreated them, and all of a sudden a hand would shove them against a wall and literally knock their front teeth out. And one man accused his wife of knocking him against the wall, and she wasn't in the room. She's in the sewing machine in Arlington, Virginia. And that man was one of dad's worst nightmares as a church member. I'm not saying that happens to everybody, but I'm telling you that you better beware how you treat the body of Christ. You better beware how you treat people that have had failures because the Bible says, judge lest you be judged the same way. And with the same met of judgment, it will come back on you again. Preach, Perry. I will. I'm almost done. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31. The Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God. When you get to heaven, it says, let no man take your crown. And the beam of judgment will be whether or not you have a crown and you're rewarded or not. And if your mistreatment of people and the idle words have been spoken, there will be no... Am I right, Pastor? Some people's rewards are burnt and others receive. And my wife and I have said this over the years, and we mean this. I'm worried about Perry Stone standing at the beam and not you but I'm trying to help you understand what I've learned. I want to hear him say, well done, and I don't want him to look at me and say, well done about hell. Y'all get that in a minute. That's a little kind of a side thing. I want, to, I want him to say, well done about the kingdom and entering the kingdom. I'm going to conclude with this. I have a, a longer story to tell, but I think that this one will suffice. Everybody still here? Did anybody hear something tonight that helped you? Would you raise your hand, please, if you heard something tonight that helped you? Thank you. I was with an old minister. This minister was a friend of mine from the time I was a kid. I'm talking about a kid. Young, teen, te young teenage preacher, right when I was called, way back before then, actually. And we happened to be in a neighboring state, and they'd asked me to come and do night services, and they'd asked this precious man that I had known for quite some time to do morning services. And I was excited to be able to be with him to see him. I'd never heard him tell this story. I had never heard this story. And I don't know that anybody really knew this story but at all. 
but maybe him and his maybe him and his wife. But I knew I knew his wife. I knew who she was, a very sweet lady. And as far as I knew, they'd had a great marriage their whole life. And again, I would be with him from off and on. I'd go to churches to preach and uh, and and knew him quite well. We're driving a good distance. He begins to tell me a story that I actually felt a little uncomfortable with him saying, knowing how I preach about these things. But it's almost like he had this on him and he's trying to get this off of him like once and for all. So he begins to tell me, he said, when I was a young minister in a church, my wife and I were pastoring there at this church. We had a couple children back then. I found out my wife had been completely unfaithful to me. Now, you got to understand, I've known this guy for years since I was a kid preacher, but I'd never heard him tell this. And I'm thinking, you know, I, kind of, I get this. I don't know if you ever get that where we get this like, ooh, don't say too much because I, I just don't want to know, you know, really. I just, but I could tell this bothered him. And, he was, it, there, and there's, a, there's, a, there's a story behind this anyway. And he says, he talked about how that when he found out who the guy was, he put a gun to the guy's back that was going to blow his, blow his back off. And he made this guy sign a paper of what he did and date it. So I'm, here, I'm listening to this and think, okay, where's this going? And he folded this paper up and kept it for years in a certain place. He's called it a, a, a special place. I don't know where it was. And he said, I kept the family together because we had some babies. And I happened to know who the kids were, and I knew they were grown up at that point. And I thought, wow, that's, that's something. So he began, but he told me a little bit more detail than I wanted to hear. But as a friend, I said, have you ever told anybody this? He said, no, a couple people in the family knew, but I've never, in my family knew, but I've never told this before. And I'm thinking, why is he saying this to me? I just almost wish he hadn't even said that because I, I don't like to know people's business like this of, of the past and I knew the past you don't talk about it you don't bring it up right then he begins to tell me about a time in his life when he needed an absolute miracle this was years later I don't know how many years later it was years later and the Lord said to him now listen to this you go burn that letter and you'll get your miracle he burnt the letter and the next day got his miracle. I'm talking a miracle. So now that's the part that that blessed me to hear. Okay? And I thought, wow, that so I I think maybe he, I mean, you know, he's telling me this about unforgiveness and holding on what it did and how to get rid of it. And I thought, that okay, that's powerful. And I thought, wow. I'd love to tell that. And he said, you know, if you ever tell it, don't ever use my name because some people might know me. I said, brother, I'd never tell this at all. He said, no, when I'm gone, when we're all in heaven, you can tell it. And this is no, an older story, of course. But listen to this. The next day, I go by, and he asked, me, he asked if I could pick him up instead of the pastor. I said, sure, so I go by this, where he's staying. And he looks very pale. He said, last night, everybody listen to me he said last night I had a dream of an angel and I said really he said I'm talking a real one a real not guesswork not just a weird dream and an angel looked at me and said you have sinned and God is displeased and he said oh Lord how have I sinned he said because you took something that was long under the blood and brought it up. And that is a sin against the blood. Did you hear it? And he wept and he apologized. And he said, I'm so sorry. And the only reason I said that tonight was to tell you how it affected him and what God thought about it. And I asked him, Sir, 
if it ever comes up, I would never use names. It's all under the blood. Can I tell what happened when the angel came? He said, please do, because people have to know that once a person is under the blood of Jesus, they may have done things that there's going to be repercussions for. They, they do things that they have to pay a little bit of price for, not, not in forgiveness, but maybe restoration or something. That will happen. But it is wrong for another human who is under the blood to pull out of the blood what has been washed in the blood. Why would you remind God of something he forgot? He said, I forget your sins and don't bring them up. Why do you want to remind God of what he has forgot? And that's why the Bible says we overcome Satan by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. What we say about ourselves is important and what we say about others is important and just remember where you were when he found you and I'm grateful for the blood and for the word and for the power of the Holy Ghost give him the best praise you've given him so far come on come on worship him worship worship him for the next few moments I'm, I'm finished preaching and I'm going to do a very unusual altar call. I usually will do an altar call for maybe people that are away from the Lord or they're unsaved, but I'm going to tell you what I feel tonight. If you in your past, even re, it doesn't have to be past, it can be recently, if you've heard me preach and you will say, Perry, I'm going to admit this to God because he already knows, but I need to admit it to myself. I have been guilty of the very thing you talked about. And I want God to really forgive me for that. I've been guilty of bloodletting, of going under the blood and saying things that have already been under the blood. I've been guilty of talking about people when they're not, it's not even my situation. It's not even, it don't even involve me. And I need to pray that I'll guard my heart and my mouth and let my yay be yay, my nay be nay, and I will move forward with God and realize he judges everybody, not me, and I got to keep me. If you're here and you know what I'm talking about, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out here unless God gives me a word for you that's very positive or important. Stand up on your feet right now if you know what I'm saying. Please, in Jesus' name. Let the Holy Ghost touch you. Come down to the front right now. Just make your way down to the front, please. In the name of the Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. As you, as you keep walking, as you keep walking, I want to talk to you. In fact, everybody stand in the building, if you will, please, as it's, and give honor to the Spirit of God if you're seated. One of the things that God always reminds me of, my friend Joni Lamb told me this, and I want you to hear this. She said, keep your eyes on the crown of the reward and the souls and nothing else. The crown, the reward and the souls, nothing else. She said nothing else is going to matter but that. I want you to raise your hands if you know the message was for you and I'm going to pray for you and I'm going to ask you to in your own way because I can't pray for you in this one to ask the Lord to forgive you of anything that Maybe, maybe you know, you get pulled into a conversation. It doesn't mean you meant it. It doesn't mean you intended anything evil with it. But you can get pulled into things, and the Holy Spirit wants to clear it. And if you should have to go to somebody, write them a note, and just ask them to forgive you, just do it. Because I tell you what it'll do. It'll get your conscience cleared for one thing. 
if you feel like you have to do that. All right, everybody, everybody raise your hands in this building. I'm going to pray, and all of you that are here, would you pray on the altar in your own way and ask God, Lord, I've heard your word. Father, I've heard what you've said through the word of God. I've heard what you've said through Brother Perry tonight. Lord, as we open up our heart to you, I don't want anything. Come on, just pray your own prayer. Father, we don't want anything to stand between you and between us. And God, I'm not saying that as a cliche. I mean that from the depths of my heart and the depths of my spirit. We don't want anything to stand in the way between you and us. And Lord, right now, we come to you in Jesus' name. And we ask you, God, that anything, any area where we have fallen short with our mouth, any area we have fallen short, God, with our attitude, any area where we've fallen short, God, and we're missing the mark, and somehow, Heavenly Father, we've said things or repeated things that we should have left alone and left in the hands of God. I ask you to forgive us of those things today in the name, in the name of Jesus. God, you're people need peace. They need joy. They need righteousness. They need the Holy Spirit, Lord, to minister to them. And we ask you in Jesus' name to let the Holy Spirit minister to them right now, that the power of Satan will be broken, that the stronghold of Satan will be broken in Jesus' name, and they will be forgiven, Lord God, and cleansed, and their words, God, will be removed out of the books of heaven, and the blood of Jesus will cleanse them, O oh God, because the sincerity of their heart is to be right with you. You said, God, that we are to keep ourselves, keep ourselves unspotted, keep ourselves from these things that would pull us down. Everybody raise your hands, and if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, pray loud in the Holy Ghost right now. Pray, pray where other people can hear you praying. Oh, dear Jesus, please, please, Lord, do your work right now. Thank you for this church. Thank you for Abba's house. Thank you for what you're doing, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we rebuke God the plots of the enemy. We rebuke any strategy of the enemy. Satan has come down with great wrath knowing that he has but a short time. God, that's a good thing because it means Jesus is coming soon. And, Lord, we're asking you to keep the people of God to preserve their mind, to preserve their heart, and to preserve their spirits, Lord, in you. And, Heavenly Father, I pray in Jesus' name that they'll walk closer to you. You're going to have a remnant. Let us not be the five foolish virgins. Let us be the five wise virgins. Let us be the five that are wise, Heavenly Father, and that we prepare and we do the right thing and we're led by the Spirit of God. Heavenly Father, we forgive those who've trespassed against us, Lord, even as you have forgiven us, and we ask you to do your work. Oh, everybody raise your hands in the altar. Pray out loud. Come on. Everybody begin to pray out loud. I want the musicians to just sing that song just a few times. Nobody go back to your seat. Just raise your hands and worship right now. Praise God. Praise you, Lord. Everybody in the building, raise your hands and worship right now. Just spend a little bit of time with the Lord. He wants to touch you and confirm the words you've heard preached. Glory to God. Worship for a moment more. 
Give him praise and glory. My, my. Hallelujah. If ever a timely word was delivered to Hamilton County, you just heard it tonight. What a timely word. You need to know that what you can't see, God is going on. God's up to something. Not only here in this meeting, but around the nation and around the world. And I'm excited about us gathering here for this Fresh Oil Conference. It was birthed in my spirit decades ago. And my son asked me last year, we did it one more time, but this year, he said, can you get Perry Stone, Randy Caldwell over here? I said, probably can. And uh, they're coming. And so tomorrow morning, Brother Ron Jones, who has traveled with me and preached across the nation, he'll be uh, our 10 o'clock service. He'll be our speaker. I know many of you have to work. And uh, but some of you can be here. How many of you can be here for the 10 o'clock service? Put your hands up. Well, come on in. Let's sit down around close to the front. It'll be great. Tomorrow night, I'm bringing a message I've never brought before. Many times when I'm asked to preach, I'll resurrect one of the good ones from the past. But the Lord has uh, put a word on me tomorrow night. This is a prophetic summit. And uh, the Lord wants me to bring a message to you on standing in present truth. Peter said that we'd be established if we stand in present truth. You say, well, I, I know the truth. No, you don't. I'm going to share some things that's going on around the world toward the end of my message tomorrow night that you don't know about, but that will make you want to shout because it fulfills the Word of God. I know many of you thought when COVID came, the end of the world came. No, it was a test. And it's time for the assembly to assemble. Our pastor, he called off the services when COVID hit in 19 for two weeks. Called me up and said, Dad, if it's just me and you, we're having church from now on. And we never again missed a service. And we didn't have any big crowds. We're not back yet to the crowds that we had before COVID. Most of you pastors know that. But understand that greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. We get this thing straightened out, Perry talked about tonight. We'll see revival break out across America, I'm going to tell you right now. But we need to be established in present truth. Brother Jones, come on up. We believe that you're here for a reason. Pastors are here for a reason. Because God, God is moving, folks. I know you're not going to get it on the news media, but there, there are movements of God going on. There, they've been a, in Southern California. There's been great revival. 45,000 people have been baptized in the ocean. That may not be the way you do it, but God is at work. And we need to wake up to what he wants to do. Brother Jones, Wow. For all those who cannot make it in the morning, I would encourage you to go online and watch it. God has dropped a word in my spirit that shook me to my core. And the reason that most of us are probably going through what we're going through is because we have made God too small. Come on. We serve a global God. We sell a God that so loved the world. But see, we have got caught up thinking we got a God of the stars and the stripes. The Bible didn't say for God loved the stars and the stripes. God loved America. It said for God so loved the world. Tomorrow, God has dropped in my spirit. We're going to be coming from the book of Zechariah. It's been all in here tonight. The all, 
and symbolic, but it's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, said the Lord. Not, not for a positive. God has to get rid of the negative in your life so you can see the positive. So tomorrow I encourage you. This is a global word. You will be helped if you hear what thus say the Lord. We've been using the wrong tool too long. Give God some praise. Saturday, Randy Caldwell will get here late Friday night, and on Saturday morning, he's going to start his teaching on the days of Noah, on the end time. And he'll come back Saturday night and uh, wrap that up for us. And you don't want to miss that. And our pastor is inviting everyone to come and enjoy service with us and see how we do it here on Sunday. So we're going to have a great time uh, together. Don't forget to go by. Brother Perry's got, I may have a table out there. I know we, I was asked to bring one. I've got uh, angels and demons and uh, unexplained mysteries. We found some of those. We've got those two books. And I've got these King James Bibles that are leather bound that uh, I got a few of those at a real good price. About a $50 Bible. It's 25 and we want you to have one. Somebody said, you still using the King James? I love the King James Bible. I don't always use it, but I always read it. Somebody said, why? I said, the version of 1611 will take you to heaven. That's why I love it. So I've got a few of those. The print's big. And if you want a handy Bible you can carry around, you don't need a briefcase to carry, we've got a few of those out there uh, as well. I'm blessed. How many are blessed here tonight? Father, right now as we lift up our voices to you, I want to thank you for our pastor and his family and for the worship team and all the staff and everybody that's worked so hard to prepare this. And Lord, thank you for Perry and Pam Stone and for their ministry worldwide and for the, for the thousands upon thousands that are touched by his television ministry and the many that have been blessed in this church, Lord, and are around the world doing mission work now. We thank you for that. And God, we ask you, to just give us a strong night's rest and then let us arise in the morning and gather again to worship. And we'll give you praise, honor, and glory for what you're doing in Jesus' name. Now let's sing another one before we go. They done left, don't leave. Let's lift up one more chorus before they go. Give God a shout right now. It's your